Have you experienced the awesome power of the Panasonic Real 3DO system? Obviously. Presenting 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. It's time to put away your toys. 3DO from Panasonic Gold Star and Creative Labs. A new low price and free games. Mind graphics of Panasonic Real 3DO. 3DO. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 3DO Experience, the 3DO Retrospective Podcast, where we talk about the 3DO console, the company behind it, and everything in between. I am Bill, and this is Threk. How you doing, Threk? I'm doing a frosty, so I'm doing amazing. Mm, sorry. Uh, I wanted to do that. Yeah, uh, I'm eating a frosty right now, so I'm, 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 I guess, I guess I'm doing okay. How, how are you, Bill? Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm just tired. This, this week's been, uh been a lot i've been doing a lot of um we're, we're like backed up to hell at work, work right now so i'm like doing like all sorts of side jobs like trying to catch up on things and yeah, it beats the hell out of you after a while yeah i'm in that phase at work right now where we're tearing down one seasonal section for the next one so because oh yeah it's valentine's day ha- ha- happy valentine's day to you weird fucks out there um yeah so yeah we're, we're we were tearing that down and now we're setting up Easter because, you know, that's what's next. It's at the end of March this year, which is weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's an odd. It's weird because we go through like February, we've got President's Day, which not everyone gets off. And then like, the next major holiday is Easter after that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're St. Patrick's Day. Right. We usually don't get that one off, though. Oh, people take the day after off. Uh, I'm aware. <laughs> I'm aware. No. I usually don't, but I don't really uh, drink. I drink, but usually just on weekends, and it's always midweek. So, yeah. I mean, I had a phase where I did a lot of drinking and stupid shit, but you know, I think I had reached the peak of that. You know, like what when you're crawling out of people's apartments that you don't know who they are. And you're like, why am I here? Why did I just throw up in there on their living room floor? And it's like four in the morning. And you're like, I probably shouldn't be doing this anymore. And then you stop. And that's what I did. Yeah, yeah I've, I I cut it back to just weekends. And that's, I think, kept it under control. I, I got really bad during COVID. But I think a lot of people did. So. Yeah. My, my, my vices are more just like poor diet. Yeah, that's there's to, always that. Yeah, it, it just doesn't help that you're constantly surrounded by like stuff that isn't good for you, like constantly. And but you, you find ways around it, I guess. Yeah, just trying to keep an exercise routine is usually my uh, go to these days. Yeah. And, and also I go out of my way to be sure I have things that are good for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the best. Oh, yeah. Um. So you might be noticing we're recording a day later than usual for the podcast. Uh, we had we had an episode planned. And things kind of fell through on that, so we'll be doing that next week. But yeah, fuck you, Aaron. <laughs> fuck you. I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. Uh, no, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll be doing that. He, he decided to spend Valentine's Day with his wife. What a piece of shit. Am I right? <laughs> what a little yeah. pussy. Instead of hanging with the boys, nah, it's fine. It's fine. He's it's good. fine. I'm sure his wife's a lovely lady. Yeah. It's she's, all a good. Saint. she's a saint because she has to put up with him all the time. Yeah. I've met her once on a stream. Mm-hmm. She seemed nice. but um, I'm, I'm sure she is. If she's yes. listening, hi. I doubt it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so That'd we'll be, be doing... We'll be doing that collab, collab next week. So in the meantime, because this was completely last minute, we're going to do another shooting the shit episode. Yes, yes. I'm just going to be eating a Frosty and, I don't know, Tomb Raider's on the brain. So we can talk about Tomb Raider if you want. We could. I still have to finish the reboot. I only played the first one. 
of the uh, the reboot trilogy. I started the second one and then something came out and I got distracted and I just haven't got back to it. Okay. Well, I'm working on the third one right now. Um, I think it was uh, somebody in one of the discords. They had finished Shadow and uh, one of my IRL friends had finished Shadow. So like of, of the Tomb Raider, not that other Shadow. Um, so it was kind of on the brain. And I was like, yeah, I, I need to I need to finally get to that and knock it out. So I've been playing it. I'm not super far into it or anything, but um, I'm at a point where I'm not sure why people don't like it, at least compared to the other two, because it feels like it's more of the same. There's less of a focus on combat and more on um, exploration and going into like the challenge tombs and doing like puzzles and things. Um, and I enjoy those. I always really enjoy the environmental puzzles. And I don't mind the lack of combat focus because I think Rise had a lot of combat in it. So I don't mind too much. I mean, I, I don't know. There there are some weird things in the story. Because I will say Rise, I didn't care for Rise's story. I really didn't. I thought it was just kind of whatever. You know, whereas I think 2013 had a really solid story like i still think about that story um even though people often go on about ludo narrative dissonance when they talk about the tumor games which to me it, it just feels very dumb and pretentious like they like people just learned what that term was and threw it on tomb raider when there are so many other games that have that exact same problem that tomb raider has but they don't get that flack for it at all so i don't understand you know, and then there's people who complain about these games because oh, Laura has small boobs now. Like who fucking who fucking care? Like okay, I think it was today the uh, one through three remaster trilogy came out, and people were talking about them, right? Um, and uh, I was just you know uh, at work just YouTubing about it because I just wanted to see how they look, and you know they look fine. You know, some people are complaining about the classic mode being kind of janky where it's like, I think it was meant to be janky, but it's not the right kind of janky. I, I don't know. Don't know, don't care. I would, I would just play them in the modern version anyway because they look much nicer and run at a, a, I think, a perfect 60. Like Digital Foundry ran them through the Switch. 60, no problem, right? So, but at the front of the remaster trilogy, there's a little, a little text thing that's basically the Crystal Dynamics saying like, Oh, you know, there, there, there might be some offensive shit in these games. So we're sorry. We, we, we didn't want to cut it because it would take a lot more work. So it's just, it's here, you know, sorry, but we're, you know, going to keep it in or whatever. Um, but, and I think that's fine. I think it's fine yeah. to address that stuff. It's not, they're not even crystals games technically. Crystals no, but they, remaking. no, but they own them now because they yeah. got the Tomb Raider license after core, core. completely died. Well, no, um, no. Core got it, got the license taken away from them because Angel of Darkness was that bad. But they died not that long after. Yeah, they did a few smaller things. Like yes, they they did the the sort of iconic game between me and my work friend Hurdy Gurdy for the PS2. Um, I, I'd have to get the whole story from him, but he got it because he got a PS2, and I think he was like his stepmom or something was like. Like, oh, uh, he likes games. Here's a game. And just gave him it. And and he played a lot of it. He played a lot of it. So mm. it, it's made me want to try out that game. But learning that game was made by the same people is is hilarious to me. Yeah, it's just it's funny to me that IDOS was like, even though apparently IDOS was partially responsible for how Angel of Darkness came out because they were very like, it needs to be this, this, this. And Core, Core was like, well, shit. Yeah. Um, um, cause it's just funny to me. I was like, this game is so bad. We're taking your franchise from you and giving it to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Um, get the, the Gex team. They can do better. <laughs> well, arguably they did, but seeing that like, you know, thing in the front, which is perfectly fine. Right. Why not? You know, there's, I mean, most, if you watch watching most things on Disney plus pre like the eighties, they all have that exact same thing where it's like, oh, there's some fucked up shit in here, you know, just letting you. It's essentially a trigger warning. Jackass has it on Paramount Plus. Yeah. To be fair, 
watching Jackass now, it, it's amazing. Because, like, when you're a kid, I guess you don't think about it the same way you do now. But watching that stuff now is, is like, holy fuck. They're doing I, I, I watch it now, and I'm like, the first the first uh, skit they did in the Jackass TV show was literally the poop cocktail. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's fair to be like, there's some fucked up shit here. So just, just letting you know yeah. ahead of time. But, but with that Tomb Raider thing, I saw a lot of... I'm going to use heavy air quotes, outrage, you know, these like weirdo people on YouTube who it, they're just, they're absolutely grifting. There's this one they, channel. I'm not, never, I'm, never actually played the originals as far as most. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Like, like there's this one channel. I don't want to call her out because I don't remember her name and I don't fucking care, but like she made a whole 20 minute video about that one thing and doing like, the the fakest like this is bullshit thing i've ever seen in my life and it's like you are playing this up you do not care you're, you're just doing it to get clicks you know it's all you're yeah. doing and and i agree with you she probably never played the originals and if I she mean, did it was probably a long ass time ago and she doesn't remember if you play because, the original tomb raider you look at laura's model that mo her model is jank as fuck in the original yeah. game and it's funny that when i saw when i also saw that little thing at the front of the trilogy there were some people who was like oh there's that like that one thing in three that was kind of iffy there's that thing in two that was kind of like some people immediately were like oh it's probably because of that which is fair you know so yeah it's just a lot of like fake out it, it, it feels very gamergate or like trying to recreate that stuff you know like getting mad at you know because it's also like people who are like, oh, feminism is what made Laura's boobs shrink or whatever. And I'm like, if, if you're that kind of person, no. you really need to go outside, man. The only okay? reason Laura's boobs were as big as they were in the first game is because they fucked up a decimal point and they thought it was funny. So they just left it in. Yeah. And then they became a trademark and they're like, well, we got to stick with it. Yeah, That's why her model is so fucking stupid. In, um, the yeah. Original game. But like, yeah. But if you look at the more modern ones. You know, they they're like, eh, you know, let's, let's not give her back problems because think about it. She's doing all this acrobatic shit and she has those giant gazongas right in front. You know, she's got some back problems. OK, like literally ask any woman, you know, for some people, this might be tough. Ask any woman who has big ones how much their back hurts. They will tell you all the fucking time. Even but imagine like doing those like, like kick flips and yeah. like shooting double pistols at wolves like it. That's no, I want you fuck that. Even going back to like the soft reboot with um, Tomb Raider Legend, like they weren't that big in Legend. Like Legend, no, her model is no. much better in that game. Again, it's all just fake bullshit. But I will say, with the Tomb Raider series, I've only really went through the reboot trilogy. That's the most I've ever played. I had the original on Sega Saturn mm -hmm. when I had my Saturn collection, and trying to play that game with a D-pad wasn't gonna cut it. I don't think it had 3D controller support because I did have the 3D controller. So that was a launch title for Saturn. And I believe that was before the 3D controller, if not launch or very early Saturn game. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe the 3D controller was a thing yet. Yeah, it wasn't until Nights, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, which I think that would help. But but what, but the, the remastered trilogy, I think it's what, like 30 bucks right now. I threw it on my wish list. So when it's like half that, I'll probably just buy it. I may, end up, I'm, I may end up going through more of the series because I am enjoying what I'm playing here. And I'm curious are, for the back catalog. The, the early games are a little jank nowadays, but they're still kind of fun. Um, my favorite that, part about uh, the second game was the uh, the quote-unquote nude code. Which, uh, oh, I've was, heard about that. Which was just the developers trolling all the losers. Basically, you type in the code and Laura jumps in the air and it explodes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's, that's your nude code. She's so nude, she's dead. Yep. Yeah, that's funny. And uh, I bought, I think it was Legend on Series X. I think it was like two bucks or something. Legend's so, really good. I've heard good things about, was it Legend yeah. Anniversary and Underworld, I think? Yeah, those were Crystal's first three the, games the before the... Before the first the Crystal trilogy, yeah. Yeah. And then I was looking into when they were when they announced, I think it was 22, they announced they're working on another Tomb Raider, another reboot, but I think it's... For, from what I read, it was supposed to be something that kind of brings all the timelines together or something. And it's going to I think it's going to have a little bit more of a focus on the survival aspect, you know, which I, I actually think is a good idea. 
with with how especially with how the reboots have gone it's like if you want to go in that direction i don't see that as a bad thing at all so maybe get a little bit uh past the whole like oh it's just uncharted thing and kind of give it its own direction because even though these games get compared to uncharted a lot i i i actually find them better games overall than uncharted like people like the story and the characters of those more and you know they do the the big thing whatever it's trying the cinematic platforming thing pretty well but i think tomb raider takes that concept and tries to craft more of a game out of it unless yeah. it's a movie like shout out to uh to a friend of the show uh, chris over at a novel console uh, he recently did a uh, an episode uh, talking with uh, josh from still loading podcast and they actually summed up naughty dog like perfectly to me where like they literally pointed out that their gameplay is never the greatest but their stories are really what bring people in I would agree with that. Which, after hearing that, I was kind of like, "Yeah, he's right." Though I do like the um, the Crash trilogy. Yeah, Crash is kind of the exception to that. Yeah, because the Crash games aren't really known for their stories. I mean, they have one, but it's very yeah, mild. Because I mean, you look at Jack and Daxter, and it's like, aside from the first game, the gameplay in two and three is very meh. Like, there's parts that I like, but parts that kind of like the gunplay sucks. Yeah, but the story is where it's at because, like, out of the big three, I always thought Sly was the Sly was the best platformer. Ratchet had the best gameplay, and then um, uh, Jack and Dexter had probably the best story. It was the angst. Yeah, even though I've only really played Daxter, the PSP game, I haven't touched the other ones, so I can't say too much. This wasn't the first Jack and Daxter meant to be like a Mario sixty four. Yeah, it's a it's a collectathon. It's a really so good collectathon. I'd probably like it because I do like 3D collect on platformers. And then two, it turns in like an open world GTA thing or whatever. Where it's like, oh, he talks. And was it like the first thing he said? He's like, I'm going to fucking kill that shithead. Or yeah, his his stupid. um, uh, Daxter finds him after the events of Daxter. And he literally goes, come on, Jack, say something for once. And Jack just goes, I'm going to kill Praxis. And it's like, whoa, I'm gonna kill that bitch. Like, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, which which at, at, they're probably just kind of poking fun of like that early 2000s angst at the time. Well, another thing that, that was, would be uh, my guess. Jack one was also heavily criticized for being too easy because it, it's a very simple. It's a it's a great platform, but it is pretty on the easy side. Like I had no issues 100 percenting it. Yeah. Um. So uh, in response, they made Jack too hard as fuck for no reason. <laughs> and then with Jack three, did it kind of even out? Yeah, Jack Three is more in the middle. Although there's okay. a lot of there's a lot of uh, driving like sections that are very. Well, th- imagine a lot of driving sections in games that are kind of tacked on. It's not the funnest shit. Oh yeah, because then they made a whole racing game out of Jack. Yeah, that they didn't did. make any sense to me. I just thought it was Naughty Dog's weird obsession with making uh, kart racers after three games, which I'm still waiting for Uncarded. But um, Uncarded would have been fun. You know, I would, I would have been, a, I would have enjoyed that. It would have been a funny, like inside joke, but I, I honestly was happier with Uncharted Four. So yeah, well, my my guess is like, oh, Sony's too serious for that, because it feels like they they can't allow their studios or their games to be like silly at all anymore. They all have to unless, be very serious or unless feel like ins- unless it's Insomniac. Yeah, yeah, because Ratchet's the only one that's still hung around which is kind of weird when you think about it because of like jack ratchet and sly i was always a sly guy i love sly cooper to death and you know i i played a little bit of ratchet and clank but i always just thought it was okay like it never really blew my mind but i've considered going through that series because i would probably enjoy them like i remember when we hit the ps3 i was like oh they're still doing ratchet games you know, I was just completely out of the loop on that one. And I don't think Jack and Daxter ever got PS3 games. I think they did that collection for them. They did the collection. The only so they got Daxter and then there was that PSP game, The Lost Frontier, which is. Eh, it's, it's, it's a game. It, it's got decent gameplay. The story is fucking bizarre, though, because Naughty Dog clearly didn't make it. Yeah. And so then apparently, apparently Insomniac wants to do more Sly. They just. I'm not insomniac. Um, Sucker Ratchet. Punch wants to do more Sly. Yeah, they just they just don't, don't have, have time. Yeah, because they're one one game studio. Yeah, because they're focused on the next 
Ghosts of game. So, because if I remember correctly, during the PS3 era, it was Sansaru Games went to Sony and said, "Hey, we'll do another Sly game if you want." And Sony's like, eh, "Remaster the trilogy first. and then they did that. And that and that collection on PS3 is fantastic. Like it's one of the really, really good PS3 collections, in my opinion. And it went so well, they're like, "Okay, make Sly Four." And Sly Four happened, and it's it's fine. It's I don't know, uh, man. It's a good game, but it's not two or three by any means. Oh, not even close. I, like, I mean, I'll I'll even think it's as good as one, and one is very whatever. It has moments that are better than one. I'd say it, it's it's a very odd game to me because you can clearly tell Sansaru really cared. Oh yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely made with a love for the franchise, but it wasn't made with the the game know how that Sucker Punch has, you know? And like, especially act- the writing, because my God, that story. Oh, the writing is so bad. They shit um, all over well, the ending to three in so many ways. For re- which I think if Sucker Punch had done it, it probably would have been funnier. Cause it feels like the ending of Sly Three is like, eh, they're gonna find a way around it. You know, they would, but just the way they do it in four just didn't work for me. But um, when I bought my Vita, the first game I bought for it was Sly Four because I wanted to own it again. I've played a bit of it on Vita. It's it's the same game, so I gotta track that down at some point. Yeah, I mean, I have the digital copy because it was one of those like three games that they did that they were like cross buy. You buy it on PS3, you also get the Vita version. It's like, yeah, which is which is neat. I like that they do that. It was neat. Um, they only did it for three games, though. Which is weird. But yeah, it's, it's, yeah, Sly, Thieves in Time. I mean, if you've played the other three, go for it. Like, might as well. But, you know, if you haven't played a Sly Cooper game, play Sly 2. Yeah, 2 play. is amazing. Oh, like, I replay that game every couple of years. It's so good. Still an amazing game. As a pure platformer, I still think Sly 1 is a fantastic game. Yeah. Yeah, Sly um, 1 is is still really good, but Sly 1's much more linear and level based, whereas 2 yeah. and 3 go for the the open hub, like the the GTA design where it's an open hub and then you do all the missions within the hub. Yeah, it's like a mission you know? structure which works really well. Yeah, yeah. Game. Yeah, and I, and it allows for the multiple characters and the multiple play styles, you know. Like Sly 3 is probably my favorite just because of how far out they expand the formula by like adding in all these other characters Mm. and really seeing how far they could push doing all of these different things, you know? And uh, one of my favorite moments in the Sly three story, it's the area where you're doing the dog fighting. Mm. And, and I think it's Bentley is trying to distract like the, the champion. Right. And, um, you know, and he just goes up and just like stares at him and doesn't say anything. And the guy's like, what, what, aren't you supposed to say something? Say something, you know? And Bentley just said, well, my mother taught me if I have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. And then he just goes back to being silent. He's like, really? You're not going to say anything? Damn. That's cold, man. <laughs> oh, su- sucker punch. Like, <laughs> so good. Like, like that's real. Yeah, that's a really good, like, subtle joke, you know? So I appreciated that. I've I've tried to find a way to incorporate that into real life, but I haven't met anybody that way yet, so. Maybe one day I can be a little shit. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Su- Sucker Punch are great, even though I've only really played the Sly Cooper games. I haven't tackled anything else they've done. I, I highly recommend Infamous. Yeah. Well, when I when I eventually get my PS5, um, I will go through like the Infamous games. I'll go through Ghost of Tsushima. Like, those will probably be the ones I go for right away. Hopefully by then there'll be a way to play Infamous 1 and 2 on PS5. Yeah. I mean, if they're going to keep remastering all these games for PS5, why not remaster PS3 games? Or take, like, PS4 versions of those. Well, those are already playable, but you know what I mean. Like, PS3 games that aren't playable on PS5, like, go there, spruce them up, bring them over. Like, do what Nintendo did with the Wii U games. Like, you might as well. Like, people will buy them. Just fucking do it. It It seems stupidly simple. Instead of remastering a game you can already play on the system and, like, taking features out but just doing it to create like a consistency or something that just feels kind of pointless. 
I, I don't know. I don't understand it. Like, I yeah. keep hearing, I don't know if they've announced it yet, but I, I'm hearing there's like a Horizon Zero Dawn like remaster for PS5 coming. And it's like, there's literally no reason for it because it already runs at 60 on PS5. So there's no reason to do it. We'll do all this shit, but we can't get a Bloodborne remaster. Can't no. get that. Not allowed to have that. That there might be an issue with that in FromSoft, maybe. Like the rights may be in a weird limbo. It's, the only it's thing possible. I could guess. Because I know Sony published it, but and I don't co-developed know if that means... it. I believe um I believe Japan Studio co developed it. Well, it was FromSoft, right? Yeah, I believe it was made in partnership with FromSoft and uh Japan Studio, similar to how Demon Souls was. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, it was co-developed and supervised by Japan Studio. So yeah, there might be like some weird rights issues going on with that. Maybe, I don't know. But it just seems weird that that would be such an easy one to like just say like Bloodborne Remaster coming to PS5 and PC, like 60 FPS and everything. Like that's easy money right there. Like they wouldn't even have to do that much. Like like just put the frame rate in 60, maybe clean up a couple textures. Maybe throw some quality of life improvements if there are any. I've never played Bloodborne. I don't know. And just, there you go. And you can resell it at full price and people will pay for it. Like I mean, especially with how popular Elden Ring was. Yeah, like it, if Bloodborne Remaster was 70 bucks, you would hear people bitch about it, but they would buy it anyways. Oh, yeah. Because it's, it's Bloodborne, you know? I mean, it is the easiest Souls game. Like, well, Souls game. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a Souls game. Yeah. It's made by FromSoft. I call it a Souls game. It's basically a successor to Demon Souls in a lot of ways. Yeah, which which I believe, if I'm correct on this, aren't the uh, like Demon Souls, like the Souls games, um, like continuations of like the Kingsfield universe? Yes. Well, it, it it's definitely heavily like inspired by it. At, okay. At, yeah, at the very least. Okay, because I had heard that once. Yeah, those are old PS1 games. I'd love to get my hands on, but they're so expensive and hard to find nowadays. Yeah, aren't they like first person dungeon crawlers? Mm. Yeah. yeah. From Soft From Soft's <laughs> back catalog is fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've looked through it. It is it is strange. Like I remember I used to see all the time uh like Lost Kingdoms one and two on GameCube at like the rental store. And I never rented them. I don't know why. Maybe it's just looking at them. Like as a kid, I was like, "Oh, those are probably like weird RPG things." And as a kid, I didn't understand them, so maybe that's why I never got around to them. But I used to see them all the time, and I've heard I've heard good things about those games. So there were so many GameCube games that I remember seeing on the shelf back in the day, just like sitting there for like nothing, and I passed on them. And nowadays, it's like they're so expensive and unnecessary; it's ridiculous. I could have got Skies of Arcadia for fifty bucks. Yep. And and I remember liking the cover. I remember and I just I remember thinking like, oh, it was a little much for me at the time. I mean, I didn't have as much money back then. Yeah. So it seemed like, oh, that's a lot for that game. And now yep. I look at the price and I go, I should have I should have I should have just did it. You now, know? like most GameCube games, you look at the price and you just go, fuck. Why? Why? Like the and two I, Pokemon games are a hundred apiece now. It's like, what the hell? But that's Pokemon. Like, Pokemon always goes up in value. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Seriously. Like, X and Y are probably going to start going up in value. And those are the ones nobody likes, apparently. They're the last ones I played, so. Yeah. I, I've not, like, X and Y was probably the first gen I started hearing people, like, complain about Pokemon. So. Yeah. Uh, I got to replay those at some point. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe I should actually finish Sun and Moon. I only got five minutes to do it before I put it down. Uh, all I remember when I got my copy of Moon was it, it came with my 3DS, and I deleted the 100-plus hour save file that was in it and got a lot of joy out of that. And then put, like, I played enough to where you pick your starter and went a little bit beyond that, and I was just like, meh. It's fine, but I don't know if I want to stick with it. I forget the sun and moon starters off the top the, of my head. The cat, the owl, and the... Oh, Rowlet, Litten, and... The blue uh, thing. Poplio. Poplio. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I went with a uh, Rowlet. And I'm like not I, normally I'm not normally a grass type. I'm I'm usually the water type. See, I usually but, always I pick know. the grass type, but for some reason I saw the owl and I thought it was I just thought blathers and I was just like, nope. I mean, Rowlet looks like the SpongeBob meme of hi, how are you? That that's what he looks like, and I think that's why I picked him. Mm. But yeah, usually with all the, the Pokemon starters, I tend to go the water type one. Don't know why. It's just it's just those the like like I always went Squirtle in Gen One, um, Gen Two. Yeah, I'd probably go to it. Toto Dollar Cyndaquil. Um, Gen Three probably Mudkip. Yeah, G- Gen Four Piplup. Absolutely. Who doesn't love Piplup? He's so cute. He's a cute little penguin. He's Gen, great. Gen Four, Gen Four and Five probably the last two that have that just have great starters all around. Yeah, yeah. Oshawa. He's also really cute. And then X and Y. Oh yeah, I go Froakie. Absolutely, because he turns Froakie into Greninja. Because he turns Froakie into Greninja. Yeah. Froakie was Greninja's... the first water water type I picked. Yeah, he turns into a fucking ninja with like a tongue scarf, scarf or whatever. It's weird as hell. Um, but yeah, I went Rowlet and Sun and Moon, Sword and Shield. <sighs> Fuck, I don't know. None of these are that appealing to me. Oh no, they, they, the starters have gone downhill so fast. <laughs> yeah, and then. I liked in Legends they gave you like three that we've already seen before, but mixed up. Oshawott, Cyndaquil, and I forget. Rowlet. Rowlet, and everyone yeah. picked Cyndaquil. I was just like, yeah, I was That's expected. because it's Cyndaquil, yeah. Oh, yeah. And two, and the, maybe. The old one, they were all like, ooh, Gen 2, Cyndaquil. <laughs> yeah, and then the new one, I'd probably go Quaxley. Is that the duck? the duck? Yeah, the duck. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I like the water types. I don't, I don't know why. My favorite's uh, Pokemon Sceptile, so I always just pick the grass types. That's fair. That's fair. If, if I had to, well, I always used to say my favorite Pokemon was Ditto, just to be like, haha. But if I had to pick one, I'd, it'd probably be Squirtle. I'd keep him as a pet. I feel like he'd be a good pet to keep. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a funny clip. I think I posted it in one of the discords of... um. Sports commentator Stephen A. Smith, somebody like tweeted him out, like, which one you take? And, and it was the Gen 3 starters or Gen 1 starters. And he's like, What the hell are these? And um, he said, like, Bulbas, Bulbasaur, Bulbasaur, Sar, uh, uh, Char, a uh, uh, Chamander, he said Chamander, <laughs> and uh, and the Squirtle. Um, but he he picked, and I called it, he picked a uh, Chamander. Uh, and he said, because it reminds me of me because of my forehead. <laughs> He's like going bald. <laughs> uh, that's good. I, I respected that. And then somebody showed him um, the final evolutions, you know, like which one. And he's like, oh, Charizard. Like he's got fire on his tail. Like, hell yeah. I mean, who doesn't like Charizard? Everybody likes Charizard. Most people like Charizard. <laughs> he's very po- he, he's very popular. He's one of the most popular Pokemon we got. I'm reading the Pokemon manga right now, and it's like, it threw me off that the that uh the main character Red doesn't pick Charizard in the manga. He, is he Bulbasaur? Yeah, he picks Bulbasaur. It's weird. Well, because that's who Ash picked, I think, at the start. No, no, Ash um Ash got um Pikachu. I I thought the Pokemon anime started with him getting Bulbasaur, and that's why Bulbasaur's no, no. number one in the Pokedex. No, in the Pokemon anime, he goes to pick up his Pokemon, and Professor Oak's like, "You slept in. They're all gone." <laughs> Oh, okay. And he gets Pikachu because it's all that's left. Because I swear to God, he had a Bulbasaur. Well, he does get Bulbasaur. He gets all the starters eventually. Oh, yeah, as we all do. That's why in Pokemon Yellow, they make it so you can get all three because they designed it kind of off the anime. Yeah, but I didn't play Pokemon Yellow because I'm not a Pikachu fan. I don't I don't like Pikachu. I always found Pikachu kind of annoying. I always preferred Raichu. Yeah, Raichu's cooler. I was hated cool. that you. I was hated cool. you couldn't level him up in a uh, yellow. Well, I remember the the episode of the anime where Pikachu was going to evolve into Raichu, and Ash had to make the decision to stop it. Like it was like a whole thing. He's like, "Oh, I can't let him be Raichu." It's like, "Well, you don't want him to be better. You want him to be worse. What's wrong with you?" Ash Ash was <laughs> Ash got his badges in the most fucking. Don't say that word, Bill. That's offensive. <laughs> our first edit everyone hey, hey our first edit. 34 <laughs> y'all didn't y'all didn't get to hear it but 
Bill has made his first edit on this show. It took it took almost thirty episodes. We did it. I, I try to I try not to say that every now and then, but sometimes it slips out. And I'm just like, yeah. why does that just slip out though? Like it's not that hard to because, not say. No, it's it's because we've we grew up in that era, and it just yeah. Kind but of like, I don't say it anymore. I don't usually. Sometimes it slips out, and you just go. Ugh. If I ever say that word, and, and we'll we'll let everybody guess what word it is. Um, it, if I ever say that word, it's because I. I do it as like a joke of going out of my way to say it. And the joke is that I said it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like it's ironic. You saw, I caught myself as I said (laughs) right away. I was like, ah, it's just even better. Uh, he half asked it. Yeah. Apologies, but it was not the N word. I want to clarify that he didn't say that. That's not even in like regular. Good, good. Because if he did, I would be chastising him right now. I, well, I would. That's. I, I would put on my white savior jacket, you know, and be like, "I'm going to defend the honor of black people by telling a white person not to say the n word." Because that's what I'm supposed to do. I well, think. yeah, that's. I, I don't know. With, uh, yeah, that aside, there's, there's a difference between like, m- like middle school, like just general like Xbox gamer, Live chat, and then <laughs> something that's just <laughs> offensive in all regards and has never been. Yeah good to say so no no though even uh, the other even though I would the have, other, even though the other word you said it's like eh, it's probably not something we ever should have really said if we no, think about it like eh, well, the, the meaning of the word has changed over time and yeah just, as words do yeah no i would have if i said the other word i would have just canceled the podcast right away and been like <laughs> i don't i shouldn't be podcasting anymore i'm gonna do a solo podcast about the atari jaguar yeah should be funny anyways um, moving on from that uh, yeah i don't know how we move on from that um let's see yeah like why did they name him turtwig that's such a stupid word Turt- turtwig the the grass type in gen 4 oh turtwig turtwig i don't like that it sounds wrong chimchar yeah. yeah chimchar is fine See, I like Gen Fives because they were all everyone made like metal Metal Gear jokes off of them because of uh, Oshawa. It sounds like everyone was like yeah. it's Revolver Oshawa. Revolver Oshawa, yeah, yeah, yeah. Revolver Oshawa, the Pig Boss, and uh, Solid Snivy. <laughs> Those were the the jokes everyone made. It's pretty good. Yeah, I remember looking through uh, the the Pokedex right with a with a friend of mine, and I was like, okay, Gen One, I know all these pretty well. You know, looking through, yeah, like Psyduck, Poliwag, Poliwrath. Alakazam, Machop, oh Machop, Bellsprout, like oh yeah, I know all these pretty well, no problem. Original 151, I, I got this, you know, I feel comfortable. And then we hit Gen 2, and I'm like, eh, I'm slipping a little bit, but I know some of these, you know, like I know Iggly Buff, Togepi. I didn't know Togepi was Gen 2. It's because in the anime they introduced, uh, they didn't introduce it a lot earlier. Yeah, and I always thought it was like Chirkapri or something, because that's that to me that's how it sounded when Togepi talked. But the Chirkapri, you know, and then and I'll never forget the episode where we we saw what Togepi could do, like the power that it had, you know, yeah. and they're like, and it freaked everybody out, especially like Misty was like, "Holy shit, I've been just cradling a nuke in in my in my in my hand for the last however many episodes," so. Yeah. Weird how that works out, I guess. I'm trying to think if anything got announced. Oh, yeah, we never talked about it. Uh, what are your thoughts on Sonic X Shadow Generations? Uh, it, it feels like, in a lot of ways, it feels like glorified fan fiction. Oh, that that is, that. when I saw that name, I'm like, that is a risky Google search <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, don't Google that, kids. Um, it, it's interesting. It's like, oh, they got the movie to promote because the Sonic 3 movie's coming out. I think it's coming out this year, and Shadow is in it. So it's supposedly we, voiced by Hayden Christensen. Which is perfect. Oh, I'm, I'm all for it. I, when I heard that, I'm like, 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 it it, be- like Idris Elba being Knuckles was weird, but I was kind of on board for it. And then um, during the Super Bowl, they announced a uh, six-episode miniseries just about Knuckles on Paramount+. Plus. Mm. And I'm like, I have to watch that? I mean, I will, but as long as it doesn't, as as long as it doesn't get Ken Panders like level bizarre, I'm fine. I have a feeling they got Idris to do all six episodes as well. 
Yeah. Oh, he's probably not that busy. Um, in in any case, um, but yeah, seeing seeing that was weird because I really like Sonic Generations. I still think it holds up really well. So getting to play it again, but with that Shadow campaign will be interesting. I'm you interested know? in the Shadow camp. I'm just glad it's getting a port to modern systems because Generations is still an excellent game aside yeah. from its final boss, which is like yeah. the worst part of that game. Yeah. I mean, we could do like a special 3DO or GNC about it because we're obviously both going to play it and talk about it. So, Or get Matt to play and we'll do a Geek Addicts or something. Yeah, I'd be fine with that because, yeah, because I, I wasn't expecting to re- have to replay Generations this year, but um, let's see. Yeah, they've done Colors. They've done Generations as far as like remasters. Do you ever think they'll do anything with Lost World? Think they'll bring I, it back? I doubt it. it. That the entire the Wii U deal, I feel like they're just gonna pretend never. I mean, it's on PC, so they yeah. kind of might just look. I mean, then again, Generations is too, though. Yeah. Well, I I think with the gen- Generations thing, it was probably just like, oh, we can take a game that's already really good, just add a bunch of shadow BS to it, and then rebrand it, and everyone will go, oh yeah, that one, that's the good one. Yeah. And just kind of go from there. Like they they weren't gonna remaster shadow the hedgehog which would be incredible you know but i mean with lost world i would say like fuck it put it on switch ps5 and xbox why not like i, I know mean, it's, people aren't it's high not a on that bad game. game it's not a bad game it's just such a average game yeah but i feel like it's one of those games it's like just just do it it probably wouldn't take that much effort to do you yeah. know why not and then People have been asking for uh, heroes to come back. Um, why not? You I mean, know? heroes isn't bad. I mean, heroes is fine. It's the, never the, gotten, the a, it's never ever gotten a port to any. Like once it got like PS2, Xbox, GameCube, PC, and then that was it. Which kind of blew my mind when I first the, learned it. It never been the ported PS2 ever. Two version got put on PSN for like a month and then got taken off. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened with that, but I mean, it's because they realized it was the PS2 version and the PS2 versions of flaming pile of shit. Yeah, probably be easier to do like the Xbox version. That's probably the one that looks and runs the best. I think GameCube technically runs the best because I heard the Xbox version had issues as well. Well, then there you go. Just do the GameCube one then. GameCube stay winning. Um, But yeah, I I think here, but heroes would require a lot more work. Like you'd have to go in and really clean that one up. And yeah. then and then we get to hear everyone complain about like you have to beat this game four times to get the true ending. Yes, you do. Yes, yeah. you do. And and I think Adventure One and Two remakes, that would probably be a beefier project that I think they would want to put a lot of time into to get that just right. Cause I think they recognize Sonic Adventure still holds a lot of weight, that name. And yeah. They wouldn't want to just because if they just ported them, eh. It wouldn't mean anything. They've already Adventure One's already been ported like a hundred times. <laughs> like, and it got worse each time. Yeah, the the most recent version is a port of a port of a port of a port. Yeah, so they'd be better off just going in and just remaking those games, kind of from the ground up. They, they'd have to because the Dreamcast version is the best playing version, and that's still a glitchy <laughs> glitchy mess. Yeah, yeah, and I think you'd want to give those games the, you know, the modern makeover. Like honestly, like FF Seven them. Just completely redo them from scratch, you know, but keep them what everybody remembers them being, you know, because there's a lot of issues with one and two that could could use some fixing. So one is just really glitchy and what I, a couple of the stories don't need to be there. Well, what I don't like about one is I I didn't like the hub worlds and having to like run around figuring out where the hell I need to go. See, just I didn't do, mind like, them because the they weren't stages. that big. Yeah, but I, I, I just found them annoying because I think Sonic works better like level based, you know, because mm-hmm. that's what Adventure Two does. Like, there's no bullshit. Just all right, level, 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 right? And I think that's much better, especially for a more kind of faster paced experience. So yeah, I give one the pass just because it's not great, but I did enjoy like you go around one's hub world and you talk to the NPCs and they actually have story arcs. Yeah, like it's not bad or anything, but it's just I I just didn't really enjoy it when I was playing through it on my Dreamcast. So yeah, it is. It's... But but I like Shenmue. So what do I know? Yeah. 
sailors. I'm going to go find some sailors. Yeah. It, it, it's a rough one, Shenmue, but it just, I don't know, it charmed me the whole time. Shenmue, for the time, was amazing. And then there's a reason why Shenmue 3 was like, wow, this game did not hold up well. Like, I'm sure Shenmue seemed very ahead of the time when it came out. But think about it. That came out in 2000. And then one year later, we got Grand Theft Auto 3. And I think that completely threw Shenmue under the bus. Well, because 3 actually had direction. Shenmue's whole gimmick was that it was supposed to be this game where you kind of just jumped into the world. And there was a story, but you didn't really have to follow it. You could just do an immersive sim. I think is maybe what they were going I think for. You Suzuki referred to it as the genre he wanted to call it was literally free because you could do anything in it. Is he full of himself? I don't know if to be honest, he's or is he, he just, really, or is he just one of those guys who's like he's an art, uh, he's an artist, and it's like that's just how he like talks, but sometimes think, it, it's hard to get the the meat of the information out of him, you know? I think it's mostly he's like an artist. Yeah. Like, I, is, like, like I don't majority, want to say he's pretentious or anything. Like, I know he's done good work. The majority but. of his uh, background, I mean, even Shenmue to a degree s- speaks for his uh, talent. Yeah. It's not like he, like, kind of lucked his way through, because, I mean, AM2 made some of the greatest games Sega ever made. Yeah, like he he did Space Harrier, Outrun, Afterburner, Virtual Fighter, um, Virtual sort of, Racing. Yeah, even stuff like Sword of Vermilion, um, Daytona USA. Yeah, Virtual Cop, Virtual Striker, Fighting Vipers, Sonic the Fi- Fighters, Mega Mix. Ah, eighteen um, wheeler American Pro Trucker, best trucking game ever made. It's not a bad game. It's a fun um, game. It's a really oh fun oh be- oh. Do you ever play Beach Spikers? That like Sega volleyball game on GameCube. Yeah, I've pl- I've that game's that. awesome. Love that game. Yeah, he he has done a lot of like genuinely good stuff. And then Shenmue is obviously more his baby. Honestly, um, I think his weakest game is Shenmue Three. To be honest, I've never played Shenmue Three. I don't know if I'll ever get around to play it. Maybe when I get a it- PS Five, I'll try it out. But I never. I to be fair, I never finished Shenmue Two. It's fair. I mean, Shenmue Two is good. But it just, I don't know, it just felt like more of the same. Whereas I think Shenmue 1 is, was really like, it felt like Shenmue 1 was trying to be something very different and very unique. And I think it does succeed in being unique. Whether or not it succeeds in being good, I think is a different conversation. But then Shenmue 2 feels like it's just taking the Shenmue formula and making something that's just more of a linear story-driven experience. Well, it was the second right. part of a six-part storyline. Yeah, and then what, was it Shenmue 3 was like parts 3, 4, and 5 or something? No, Shenmue 3 also ends on a fucking cliffhanger. That's what pissed everyone off. Well, because I think even he said that Shenmue 3 wasn't going to end it. Yeah, just the fact is, though, a lot of people didn't have any, like, hope. Didn't didn't have a lot of hope that it was going to go beyond 3. Yeah, and then everyone got mad at how it looked. I and mean, it looks fine. It's I mean, just... I, I thought it, to me, with Shenmue, it's like, eh, it should just look like that. You know, yeah. it it looks kind of funky and weird, but like whatever. Like that's kind of what I expected out of it. I think the problem Shenmue has nowadays is that it's quote unquote successor. I don't know how much of a successor this truly is, but a lot of people yeah, say Yakuza. Yakuza was basically the successor to Shenmue. There are similarities. I, there I see are. it. I see it to a degree. I think Yakuza is a much better designed series overall. Well, I think I think why is because Yakuza has. It knows what it wants to be right away mm. and just goes for it. Like even the little bit of the original Yakuza I played on PS2, like it has direction, you know, like it has a well-established character in Kazuma Kiru and it has a story that it wants to tell and it tells it. But obviously as the series goes on, it develops more and more into being its own thing. Yeah. Um, but you can tell from the first Yakuza, they were trying to, the way I describe it is as if Shenmue and Grand Theft Auto had a baby. Yeah. That's kind of what it feels like. And, and and I remember seeing the first Yakuza at the time and not really being sure what to think about it. And I heard people saying like, oh, it's just, you know, like a like a Shenmue type game or it's like, oh, it's like a GTA clone. Like, that's what I had heard at the time. And so I'd put it off. And then years and then you play it and then, you're like, this is nothing like either of them. 
it has elements of both, but you know, it is still very much its own thing. Um, and nowadays it's absolutely its own thing. It's, well, it's kind of, it's kind of a beast in its own way. Now it's a full on RPG, a good yeah. RPG, but it's, it's I, just, yeah, I, I've been playing infinite wealth, you know, a little time here and there. It's what a lot like, of game. Well, what I like about it is it's, it's one of those games that I can just play a little bit of, put it down, do something else and come back. And I'm still right there. It says like, so much about that studio that they literally, the RPG thing was completely a joke, and then they went with it and made it fucking great. Yeah, and it's some of the best turn-based combat I've ever had, I've ever experienced. And Infinite Wealth even makes it better. Like, they fixed mm-hmm. a lot of little things that were wrong in 7, things I didn't necessarily think about or put that much weight into. But when you get to Infinite Wealth, it's like, oh, yeah, that that is better. Like, that and I they managed to... More. They managed to follow up such an amazing character like Kiru and replaced him with Ichiban, who is equally as fucking amazing. I love Ichi. I- Ichi's he's he's the best. He's just he's the best. I do have one complaint with Infinite Wealth, and that is I think too many of the side stories do the sectioning thing where it's like you have a little cutscene, you maybe do a little activity. And then it goes away, and then you have to do some stuff, and then you come back to it, right? Like, there are some that you do that way too many times, and it feels like the side stories just kind of drag, you know, that they feel like, oh, we have to add in all this extra stuff. Like, there's one where you help out a kid at a lemonade stand, and the amount of steps that you do in that whole one, just, it felt way too much, like, completely unnecessary. Like, the writing is still good and everything, but it felt like you could trim it down. Um, one, I think that did a good job trimming that is um, you, you meet this Hollywood director who uh, his stunt men have walked off because he wants to do realistic stunts and Kazuma and, or not Kazuma, uh, Ichiban's like, yeah, I'll just do it. And, um, and, and you basically are running down the street, avoiding like cars coming straight at you with explosions on the side. You know, it's like a Michael Bay movie. Um, you do that once. And I was like, oh, it's probably going to be like we do this like maybe a couple more times or whatever. There's a pretty extended cutscene, and then it's it. It's done. I don't know if it activated a mini game or not. It may have. But that like little cutscene right after where he talks about how he doesn't like CGI, like the director, he doesn't like CGI. He wants, you know, to, realism. He's like, it looks better if it's in front of the camera. And I agree with him on that. Mm. But um seeing Ichiban do his thing convinces the, the other stunt guys to come back. And then the director's like, oh, here's what we'll do. For the next one, we're going to have you jump off the skyscraper up there. But for added realism, we're going to get away, get rid of the safety harnesses. Genius. <laughs> and, and, the, and the stuntmen are like, yeah, sure. And Ichiban's like, what? Are you crazy? And he's like, oh, yeah, you're going to do it too. He's like, no, I'm not. And the director's like, oh, we'll have a bunch of pillows and blankets at the bottom. You'll be fine. <laughs> And Ichiban says, I think, and I can quote this, he's like, oh, uh, pillows and blankets, that'll be great for the permanent nap I'll be taking. <laughs> and he ends up just running away from the directors chasing after him. And, See, that was lo- the, and that was the end of that one. And I was like, that was perfect. I that love the brilliant. Off- I will I will remember that one. I love the off the wall freaking uh, side quests in Yakuza. Like one of my favorite ones is um, in Yakuza 0, there's like a side quest where it's like this like japanese like boy band like boy rock band is um they have this whole image of being like this like kind of like punk kind of like uh edgy band but they're all secretly softies and they want uh kiru to uh show them how to be tough so kiru's gonna do this entire like thing basically like showing them that like their stance is all wrong you gotta you gotta actually look the part and they end up getting even more fans i mean if i were to if i were to put my trust into kiru to looking tough i think i would come out of it looking tough yeah, he he does a good job of that. That's that's um, a great one. There's also this running joke in Zero where it's like there's this guy that's trying to sell mushrooms, and everyone thinks oh, he's I selling think like, I remember him. Everyone thinks he's selling psychedelics, but you know it's just regular mushrooms. I think I remember that guy because I played a little bit of Zero, and yeah, he like you meet him very early, and he's like, "Oh, you want to buy some mushrooms?" And you're like, oh, "What? What? What? You know?" And then he goes, "He's like, oh, I have all these different kinds. You know, I pick them or whatever." And 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 I think Hero tries to explain to him like, 
He's people like, are going to get the wrong idea when you say that. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm just saying mushrooms. Like- and then like there are people trying to buy them from him thinking that like, I think he sells them to him. Right. And then they're like, oh, we're going to get so high on these. He's like, oh, I'm doing good business. You know, I, yeah. I, I'm I'm sure that has an interesting resolution. But, there, you know, don't there's a know. Po- I won't spoil it. But there is a point where Kira is straight up like, you got to stop being so sketchy. Oh, yeah. Because he's like selling them in like the back alleys and yeah. shit. And he's like, oh, it's just where I set up shop. You know, it's it's, it's really good. The, I remember the one in zero of like, it was like the high school girl like selling her underwear. Oh, and and, yeah. and that takes quite a few turns. I was not expecting. See uh, any other that game one was, but that one was funny. I liked it. Any other game, and you'd be like, "What?" But and then you'd it's Yakuza, and you just go, "Yeah, yeah okay." <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it, it's Yakuza. Like they know what they're doing. You know, they, it it feels very much like they recognize how, what people make fun of Japanese culture for, and they take that and do and kind of run with it. You know, Yakuza is all just is just one big parody, and that's I think yeah. why it's so charming. Yeah, the like the main story, like the main crime drama, is usually taken very seriously, and there's a lot of really good emotional bits in there. But outside of that, yeah, they they recognize it's also really dumb. Mm. You know, and and I think they recognize that'll stick with people. You know, when you know how to mix drama and comedy, it works really like when you do serious, like when people view Yakuza as like a comedic game when it does like more serious stuff, it, it hits harder, you know? Mm. So. It's, it, I think the reason it's so successful is because it is a comedic game, but it's like so effective with its comedy that like it comes out of nowhere and you go, Oh yeah. Like people, people go into it being like, Oh, these games are just batshit crazy. And you're playing them and you're like, there are, you know, they are, but you're like the, the writing is really good. And I'm like kind of invested in these characters, you know, mm. they, they, they find ways of, hitting the right hitting the right notes and even when they make fun of their own sentimentality in the game is just is really good you know i just wish infinite wealth had more shorter side stories because if if i pull it up right now there's probably like half a dozen that are like the blue which means like there's still more to do you know like there's one i still haven't finished where it's this like um like he's like a japanese musician and he's flown to hawaii to um do like this really cool music video and have like wind and everything and he has like all of his roadies like um trying to flap like big leaves at him and it's not working but then you help this old guy who claims to be a wind shaman and he's like and you're like oh can you help with that and he's like yeah yeah i'll do it you know i i still haven't finished that one yet so i'm not sure what happens but um but i remember quite a few really good ones in seven uh like my favorite in seven was probably the the sumo wrestler who was training with the tree because his friend was uh, injured, but he was talking about him as if he was dead, you know? And then you fight him as Ichiban to be like, bro, you got to stop this, you know? Yeah. Now yeah. that whole, that whole series is just amazing. I'm glad that oh, yeah. Sega, Sega finally got it to click over here. Yeah. I think, I, I think seven has the, was it the murder mystery with the baseball guy or no, it's like the baseball player that like people want to kill him or something. I forget the whole details of that one because it was pretty late, but I just remember that one being kind of bad shit. Yeah, there's that, and then there's a uh, in Yakuza Zero. There's a uh, Kiru, uh, Kiru teaching the dominatrix how to be a better dominatrix. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I think Seven has it's like that dude who's in his underwear who can't feel pain, and you're trying to do everything. Like you beat him up, and he's just like nothing. I just I feel nothing. And then in Seven, there's also that one girl who's a dominatrix, right? And um, I'm like, she's getting a lot of shit for it or whatever, because she's bad at her job, I think. Or well, something. maybe maybe that was seven. Not, not it, yeah, because because yeah. Ichiban gets her and the dude who can't feel pain together, you know, and she like she gets him to feel pain. And he's like, oh, oh, my God, this is incredible. And they just like become an item or something. It was like they find ways of making ridiculous stuff wholesome. Like, I yeah, don't know they, how to do it. That, that must have been weird, seven. Yeah, it's a yeah, it was. It's a weird magic formula they have. And they're still doing it, you know. Like I think in this one you can kind of tell the main creator isn't there anymore a little bit, but it it's still like really good. Like the gameplay's fantastic. I really enjoy Hawaii. It's a really fun setting to um explore, especially when you get the um the uh, the streetway surfer or a Segway. You find a Segway um and you can use that as your 
like move around to. One thing I like about it is if you have it, you can go into the map and set like a waypoint and then you can just auto drive to it, which is really nice. Um, and you can also, when you start leveling up, there are certain enemies that become so weak, you can just knock them out in like one hit, which saves you a lot of time as well. Um, a lot of quality of life enhancements, I think, in terms of like the gameplay and kind of exploring. But so far, the side stories have been really good, but I, I just think they're overall not the same quality as seven. Mm. Just like a lot of them are really sentimental for no reason. And they just have too many segments that they need to like trim down, I think. From what I've heard, it gets better the more the farther it goes. But... I, I'm sure it does, you know, but the main story is actually really good. Like I'm very invested in Ichiban in Hawaii and what's going on there. Like I'm very invested in what's gonna happen. So but I'm only Did in you, chapter um... I'm only in chapter five, so yeah. I'm not super far in. So speaking of new releases, have you seen the dumpster fire that is uh, Suicide Squad? I haven't. All I've heard is that it's not very good. I've heard that the gameplay itself is painfully average and the story is just insulting. It, it, I, I think the insulting part is that this is what Rocksteady's been doing since Arkham Knight. Well, I found out, I was reading deeper into it, apparently all the people that made Rocksteady the great studio was left during the production of this game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, so I remember, like, I remember reading about, like, between Arkham Knight and this, like, the main guys at Rocksteady were leaving, you know? And this game my, drove them away, apparently. Yeah, like, this is, this is their Marvel's The Avengers game. Even though yeah. I don't, even though I think that Avengers game is better than some people give it credit, because from what I remember, that game, it starts out just like a, like a typical like just kind of a third person action adventure game. Like it's fine. But then halfway through it turns into a live service game. Yeah. yeah. And it, and that definitely felt like square Enix saying to them like, Oh, you have to throw this in. Whereas yeah. D dynamic, they didn't want to do that. So they kind of got a bad rap, but whereas with suicide squad, I, again, I think it was more Warner brothers forcing them to do all this extra stuff and then i'm sure it was a lot of turmoil at rock at rock steady trying to like make it work yeah and they drove them all away and then they this they farted out this game that somehow looks worse than arkham's night yeah it, it's so rough and i'm just so afraid that this game is going to kill them like i'm so afraid especially because <laughs> it's warner brothers and recently warner brothers has had a history of just dropping shit yeah, if it doesn't work. There's they just throw it away. Like the and only studio Rock there that seems would to... be so bad that would hurt so much if yeah. they did that. The only studio that seems to be safe at Warner Brothers is, is like Nether Realm. But Nether Realm still make quality games. Yeah, well, that's because like, Ed Ed Boon has, like runs that like a tight ship, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and they recognize that Mortal Kombat will always be successful, and if they were say to do an Injustice three it would work out just fine. Like Nether Realm are, have always been very talented, like Midway Chicago or whatever. They've always been very talented. Well, it's because so, they've always had the same guy at the top running it. Yeah, roughly, roughly. I mean, the Mortal Kombat team originally was just like a handful of dudes. And a lot of those guys are still there. Like it's not just Ed Boon, but also like Steve Dan, Perrin, Dan, John Dan Vogel, Ford. Dan, Dan Forden. Ford. Yeah, like all these guys. The only one who's really gone is John Tobias. Yeah, Tobias left. It was around like the mythologies and special forces era where I think he felt the series wasn't going in the way that it should have went. And at yeah. that time, I would have agreed with him because Mortal Kombat 4 didn't really... I don't think it hit as well as they wanted it to. Yeah. Um, I mean, they made up for it with Deadly Alliance. Yeah, but I yeah, think... Especially Deception. Yeah, but, I th but Mortal Kombat 4 was made as an arcade game. And that's True. how they were viewing it. And I think they weren't prepared at that time to do like, oh, we got to move into home consoles now. But Deadly Alliance transitioned very well. And I think Deception improved on that formula. And then Armageddon, I, I still really like Armageddon, even though it feels like a step back in some ways. Um, yeah, and then but, but they were able to make that transition a like really, really well. And for a while, that was the best thing Midway had, you know, because that's when Midway was still around. Kids, do you remember Midway? I do. Um, because at that time they had Mortal Kombat, but almost everything else they were doing just wasn't really there. Like they were making new Gauntlet games here and there, 
Um, and I think those games are better than people give them credit for. But I think at the time that wasn't what people wanted. I mean, Gauntlet Legends is is a great uh, game to still play, and it's a updated version, uh, Shadow Art, Shadow Legacy or something, I, whatever the one on GameCube PS2 was. Yeah. Yeah, and then there was that one on, I think it was on the 360, Seven Sorrows. I have that on PS2. So I think PS2, it was... Xbox, yeah. That was yep. the last one they made. And I remember liking it. Like, at the time, it didn't get good reviews. But I remember renting it and playing it. That was the one that really Don Romero, it. like, made a bunch of characters for, and then they didn't use any of his characters. Yeah, yeah. And it had, like, oh, like, Saul, Saul DeVito was there, who was also part of Midway, who was part of the Mortal Kombat team, so... Also, you know, one of the they were trying most... to they were trying to cross pollinate a little bit, but it just by that point I think they were just completely gone. You they know? put out one of the most underappreciated uh, platformers from that era too. Did you ever play Doctor Mudo? Yeah, I've played Doctor Mudo. That is a really that, cool game. You know what the fun fact about that game is? What's that? That was the final game made by the original Atari. Huh. Interesting. That was uh that was Atari Games, like the remains of Atari Games after. After the uh, they got acquired by, uh, I think it was they got acquired by Time Warner, and then Time Warner got acquired by Midway. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then yeah, that was that was Ed Law Ed Log's final game, I believe. Nice, nice. I mean, it's a good game to go out it on. It is. It's a really good platformer that nobody played. D- does fuck who owns that game now? Then probably Warner Brothers. Not that they. But Warner yeah. Brothers didn't completely buy Midway. At least I don't think they did. They like, bought they, they bought Mortal Com- they bought Mortal Kombat. That's what they wanted. They basically they, bought Midway Chicago. And that was Yeah, which was Mortal Kombat. And oh yeah, they're also doing the suffering at the time. The suffering games are really good. Mm. Those are way better than you expect them to be. Like I like when I first saw them as a kid, I was like, I don't know, some about these seem off to me. And then I eventually got around to the suffering games. And I'm like, these are good. Like, these are genuinely like fun games. I don't know if they've aged the best. It's been a long time, but like for what they are, trying to be like kind of survival horror-y, shooter-y, kind of like like kind of manhunt-ish. I think um, they're not bad, like at all. So, yeah, Midway still made good games. Midway's big problem was they just did not know how to transition from arcade to home console. Yeah, like they they definitely had yeah talented people who could really make still make good games, and they were still good games being made in the mid two thousands. You know, like yeah, your Mortal Kombat's and you know the Suffering games, and I mean um, even Mortal but there's Kombat... but like their sports games went away as well because like NFL Blitz was something they were really known for. Well, they lost the license and they couldn't yeah make it fun uh, and, anymore. Yeah, like NBA Jam kind of went away unfortunately, um, but I think that was just. At that time, people had moved on to like this was during like EA Sports Big, I think. So everyone was playing NBA Street and trying to do an NBA Jam. Well, then they did a bunch of NBA Jam and then eventually Hang Time games. So I think people just kind of got sick of them. Yeah, and even they were making games like Doctor Mudo or whatever. But they also had like I remember the Ed and Nettie game they made, the Misadventures, and it is they, they made that? whatever. It was they published it. It was made oh. by a. Uh, oh, Behavior- hey, A2M made it, I believe. Or yeah, behavior they're, as they're known now. The Dead by Daylight people. Do you know the story about why they changed their name? <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, that was a sneeze. Um well, weren't they they were originally behavior active? They then were they changed to artificial mind and movement, movement. And then they went back to behavior interactive. So they was it was it like a copyright thing? No. Th- their abbreviation during the artificial mind and movement era was A2M. Which yeah. they discovered someone had mentioned to him, you know, A2M stands for something else, right? I had to think about that for a second. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were, uh, they were informed about that and they decided to go back to behavior after they discovered that. Yeah. I don't blame them on that one. Yeah. But uh, that's the, they, I, yeah. I forgot they made a shit ton of licensed games that were uh, surprisingly oh, yeah. okay. And they made the game that caught my eye as a kid, Naughty Bear. Oh yeah, they did make Naughty Bear. It's over there somewhere, and I do intend to do a complete playthrough of it because it's a game I really want to know. I really want to know because I played the demo and I remember liking it, but I don't know if I ever liked it enough to really play. I think it was just the idea of it just tickled me when it first came out, like a teddy bear that just murders everything. 
They also but. made wet. I like wet. I, I that's another one I have now. I played and beat that. I think like two years ago. I think and I re- I think it, uh, it was fine. It was it, Bethesda eventually published it because so I think it, that was a game that was meant to be published by Midway. I think or no, I think Activision was pu- going to publish it, but then they kind of just didn't, and then Bethesda just took it because they were like, "Eh, we need something else to put out," you know, because we're in between like Elder Scrolls or whatever. I think Matt McMuscles was a uh, a bug tester on Wed, and he I think he yes he was. Whole, I think he said that the entire experience was miserable for him too. Yeah, which I'm, I'm sure it was. I can't imagine like I can't imagine a video game tester being like a genuinely fun job to be. Well, like he did a whole series nice. about um all the games that he bug tested, and he, he said a lot of them were fun. He said that one was miserable though. Yeah, like it sounds like a nice glamorous job, but it's like you don't really get paid that much, and it's kind of annoying. And nowadays, most dev studios don't really pay for that. They just, you know, early access, which is just the consumer bug tests it for them, basically. The consumers find the bugs. Exactly. I mean, they're going to find the bugs anyways. But anyways, still looking through Midway stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Blitz the League. That was controversial at the time. Um, oh, yeah. They were doing the NBA Ballers series, but that didn't really hit. They started doing a bunch of licensed games like Ant, like the Ant Bully movie game Ooh. and um, the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy developed by High Voltage. Um, and they were still trying to make Spy Hunter a thing, but Spy Hunter never really caught on. Oh, yeah. They made that really dark and edgy one in like the mid 2000s. Like, yeah, it, it looks, wasn't very good. I think it has is that Vin Diesel on the cover or The Rock or somebody. It's one of it's one of those guys. Yeah, that's that's The Rock. Yeah, nowhere to run. Oh, yeah, weird as hell. Um, like Happy Feet and Oh Hour of Victory. Did you ever play Hour of Victory? I don't think I did. Oh God, that is like probably the blandest World War II first person shooter I've ever played. They published the first two uh, Shadow Hearts games as well. That they did. Oh, they oh they published that weird um, Aqua Teen Hunger Force golf game. <laughs> I still haven't. I still have. I've I've been meaning to play this game for a long time, and I still haven't done it. That is it's such like a cart, like cart racing, fighting golf game thing, and people do not like it. But I, I imagine probably a lot of it is people being like, "Oh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, ew," you know? Because I know the Futurama game didn't get a lot of good reviews at the time. No, the Futurama game's apparently really. Meh. It's fine. It's fine. But it's, it's also be, it's better it's no, than it's it's no Simpsons hit and run. No, but it's fine. It's apparently more notable just for how expensive it is nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember when the Family Guy game came out. I played that a bunch. Wasn't that also kind of just like it was fine? It's, it's fine. Really- the the sequel isn't very good. The multiverse one. Oh, yeah, that was made by Heavy um, Iron. Yeah, poor Heavy Iron. Um, yeah, Unreal Turn. They were, they published Unreal Tournament three. Weird. Um, oh, Stranglehold. Oh, Stranglehold was a big deal for me. It's it's okay. I don't think it's a great game, but it's fine. And then, oh, yeah, they did the TNA game. I remember the TNA game. Do you remember the TNA game? I remember it. Yeah, it's not uh, bad. Like... For what it is, it's, it's not bad. But we were still in that period of the SmackDown versus Raw games still being good. So it just didn't hit the same way like the Ukes games are starting to go downhill but they weren't bad or anything yet yeah and then blitz the league 2 more oh, oh mortal Kombat versus dc universe you know technically like from a gameplay perspective that game's great but why did they censor everything <laughs> well apparently uh, it was uh it was uh warner brothers that's why <laughs> yeah and then yeah I, mortal Kombat versus dc universe man people were so pissed at this one that's Mortal Kombat 8, technically. Yeah, but it, it, everyone hated it because of that big old T on the corner. Is yeah, and all the all the um, fatalities are so lame. Yeah, like they're, which is weird because like I've seen worse fatalities in other Mortal Kombat games, but it, it it is neutered. But if you go back and play it now for a fighting game, it it it's not bad it's not a bad fighting game it plays great like i think they finally figured out the 3d formula right before they abandoned it yeah um which i mean i'm fine with because i much prefer what i think i think this one was going more for the 2d format 
it still has the 3D camera style though. Okay. It's it, not it, a pure pure 2D yeah. game like 9 was. Okay, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. I, it, it's, it's just it's just a shame we never got to rip Superman's head off. You know what I, I one other thing I find really fascinating about that game is it is one of those like games that came out right before the new 52, so it's like a one of the last real glimpses of pre new 52 DC. Mhm. It's a different time. Very different time. And then, yeah, do you know the last game that has a midway on the credits? I do not. Wheel Man. You remember remember Wheel Man? I gotta look this up. I've never played this game. I've been wanting to hunt it down. It, It like I think it's just some like BS action adventure game that's like, oh, you're Vin Diesel doing Vin Diesel things. Um, it, it, oh, it was, te- it was, well, you be soft on Netflix. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. That's not what I was looking for. Cause this came out when like in 2009, I think, which was when Midway was like selling everything off. Oh yeah. Cause most, um, cause most Ubisoft copies ended up yeah. publishing it. Wow. That's goofy. Yeah. It was yeah. still Midway in the PAL region. Thank God. Um, yeah, because that was just 2009 when they were like uh, selling everything off, and then yeah, it was Warner Brothers acquired yeah most of most of it. Yeah, well, they mostly just wanted the Chicago studio. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't to, blame them. Yeah, according to this, they required most of the company's assets, including their studios, the rights to Mortal Kombat, and the Wheelman series. They still technically owed Wheelman. The offer did not include the San Diego and Newcastle Studios or the TNA video game series. But we haven't had a TNA game since, so. I'm wondering if they ended up with Dr. Mudo just because that, Atar- that um, the, basically the former Atari studio was already long closed by then. Yeah, they, they probably have stuff like Dr. Mudo and um, all that stuff. They probably do. They probably just don't realize they do. <laughs> that would be my guess. They're it's funny thinking about dr mudo there was a ton of platformers in that era that are completely forgotten about nowadays metal arms metal arms really good one uh metal did you ever play whiplash one. no but i heard it was really good i tried playing was it vex you remember oh vex? that was vex that was, was acclaim that was the acclaim one that was uh iguana well they they were acclaim austin at that point but it was the former yeah. turok team and i remember that one because um, I was a big fan of the Legends of Wrestling games back then. They're terrible games, but I still really like them. Um, I think it was on the back of the second one. It had an advertisement for Vex. And I went out I of believe- my way to try it. And it's... Yeah, it's it's not very good. No, it's 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 very much Iguana. And I believe uh, the, the legend Jeff Spangenberg was involved with it at one point. I, I think you're right on that, yeah. For those who know, Jeff Spangenberg later went on to form Retro Studios before he was fired by Nintendo for doing softcore porn in the studio. Yeah, yeah, Nintendo don't like that. Yeah, yeah, I think Miyamoto legit showed up and was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> he, he, yeah, he had probably had some words to say. Well, he didn't get fired. They essentially bought him out and told him to get the hell out of here. Yeah, because that's how it works in companies. Just buy him out. Instead well, he was te- telling him to fucking leave, which is probably he was- what he should do. Well, they didn't own Retro at the time, I think. Oh, they, that's right. Because he was the he founded Retro, and then they kind of just like paid it. They basically paid him to go away, and uh, he then used that money to go form Top Heavy Studios, the makers of the wonderful game known as the Guy Game. How's the same guy who worked on Metroid Prime worked on that fucking game? I don't think he worked a lot on Metroid Prime. I think he just was there, and then while well, they were working on it. I mean, I'm sure he, he probably had some say in it, but he did work on uh, he did work on Turok, though. You know that that's for oh. sure. Oh, thank God. I mean, Turok <laughs> one and two are pretty good games still. They're good N64 games. That's what for, I'll say. That's for all for I'll pre, say for pre Halo FPSs. They're fine. Um, I, I tried playing one not that long ago. Nah. Yeah, I mean they're not they're not like fine I love, art. I love the I love the idea of Turok. I just don't think as a game it holds up. That's yeah. all. I just don't think they hold up anymore. But yeah, I think I, most N sixty four games don't hold up anymore. 
there's especially a, the, there's a select few that I still really really like. The only first person shooters from the N64 that really hold up are the two uh, 007 games in Perfect Dark. Yeah, but even then. Well, yeah, I mean, Halo just made FPS is just better in every way. Yeah, yeah. If if you want to know what I have to say about Halo, you, you check out a novel consoles episode on Halo. You can hear me talk more about it. Did Chris did Chris really mean it when he said it's basically you talking him off the ledge the entire time? Yeah, basically, because he did not like him at all because he doesn't like Master Chief. He doesn't like I think he doesn't like the concept of Master Chief in general. And um, he doesn't like the flood. You know, it's a lot of just like this. It, 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 a lot of his hate felt very AVGN, like fuck this shit. Right. And there, I mean, yeah, those games have some rough edges, but they're fine. But we'll, we'll get back to him at some point whenever he's ready to tackle Halo 3. Because I think we'll probably enjoy Halo 3. But, but yeah, but yeah, Warner Brothers, port Dr. Mudo. And while you're at it, port both suffering games. I think, I think those games deserve another chance. Hmm. I think uh, going back, we mentioned Whiplash. I think that was made by Crystal. I think from what I've read, that is actually Dynamics. Yeah, Crystal made that. All right. Um, I believe it's the Gex team, or at least the remains, the remains of the Gex team. Did the Gex team make the the Tomb Raider reboots? I don't think so. I think that was more the uh, the Legacy of Kane team. That makes more sense. I mean, to be fair, that team kind of was disbanded after Amy Henning left to go to Naughty Dog, but yeah, I'm sure the people there probably went over to the Tomb Raider team. Because mm-hmm. yeah, all we have from Crystal is well, that Perfect Dark game if that's ever gonna forever gonna see that. We'll 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 see Perfect Dark again. I know we will because that's uh, was it the initiative, hmm. and then and then initiative was having problems, so they called Crystal Dynamics to come in and help with Perfect Dark, and then people are saying, oh, that'll probably mean Perfect Dark's a third person game. I think it'll be fine if it is, no big deal. And yeah, they're working on another Tomb Raider that's being published by Amazon of all people. Yeah, that's weird to me, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm surprised. Microsoft hasn't tried to buy Crystal just because they've worked with them so closely in the past, and it probably, they probably they're probably still waiting for for uh, the pitchforks to go away. Yeah, though I think if they bought Crystal and Idos, I think people would probably just assume they like, oh, I thought you already had them. You know? Yeah, uh, they piece of their, but that that I, could that could also be like because Embracer bought them, and maybe Embracer because they're having issues, they're probably like, oh, Crystal's one of the studios we don't want to let go. Because yeah. they could be, they could be a potential cash cow for them. So as long as they don't kill them like they did Volition, <laughs> I don't, I don't think they'll do that with Crystal. I don't because Crystal's probably the biggest studio they have. I th- yeah, I mean, know? without Volition, yeah, yeah, and and they're probably getting some of that uh, extra Microsoft money since they're helping out with Perfect Dark. So you know, I, I don't, see. I don't think Crystal will go away. I really don't. The Crystal will probably bin themselves off before they get shut down. Yeah, I, well, I think if there was, I view it probably with Crystal is that if they, if, if there is some issues at Embracer with them, I imagine they would like, you know, call Phil and be like, hey, there, we, there's some trouble here. Do you want to come save us? And I think he'd be like, oh yeah, I'll save you, no problem. Hmm. Like, like they're like the like Microsoft's there if they need him, you know. But I, I view it as they would probably buy Crystal and Idos if it meant they didn't die. And I think people would be fine with that, genuinely. Did you see and, Disney and with this a... and with this potential whatever is going to happen with Xbox thing, as far as like third party stuff? Um, you know, I imagine like say the next Tomb Raider or whatever will probably be multi plat anyways. So, yeah. Um, did you uh, see uh, Disney bought Epic Games? They didn't buy them; they were investing in them, right? I thought they full out bought them, or or they're making moves to potentially do it well if from what i heard they they invested in epic games okay i i heard it was like they were making moves or something yeah well they're they're do i don't i don't see them i feel like if they tried to buy epic games i think the government would step in and break them up genuinely they, okay Disney, so yeah, they Disney is so big now that i think if they tried to buy the studio that has the biggest game in the world right now that I think the government would have to step in and break them up. 
So, so it's I, they so bought Disney's a, trying to be smart with where they put their money. And when you use the term investment, like, yeah. oh, we're putting a bunch of money into Epic for them to do. I don't I don't even know what it's going to be. Is it that we're going to get Mickey Mouse and Fortnite now? Is that all we're getting? It's um. so the way it sounds is they bought a one point five billion dollar stake in the company. So. OK, so they're like a shareholder. Kind. It's kind of like how Nintendo had a stake in Rare for the longest time, but they didn't own them outright. Yeah. Though the thing is, like, Epic doesn't really make games anymore, so no, I don't expect Epic biggest... to make like a Donald Duck game. <laughs> they make the biggest game. Yeah, a, a game that I think its popularity is starting to wane a bit. It's weird. It, you, every time you think it is, it, it looks like they get like a big surge. Yeah, I mean, they're still doing fine. I, like, even if they're starting to slow down, it just means oh, instead of like three billion people playing, it's like two billion. You know, like. Ooh, you know i think i've I, read I somewhere know. that like they they like they say like netflix's biggest competitor is fortnite not not in terms of what they do just in terms of how much uh time they're taking from potential customers yeah because because fortnite just got the the proper formula for longevity mm. you know that that game has been out since 2017 and as far as we know it's still going strong you know yeah it's funny. It's it's one of those games that I've never had any interest in, but I kind of respect it just for what it is. Yeah. In fact, out of curiosity, let's see. Right now, it has 2 million people playing it. Right now. Sounds about right. Yeah. So, they, it's, it's still cooking, though looking at this um, following the player count, you know, there you know, some bits here and there that kind of drop off, but th- this is going, oh, this is going like hour by hour. Like, who fuck cares about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I, according to this, it peaked once with 11 million players. So, at least this is when they started following it back in like 23, because it doesn't even have player counts earlier than that, so. Yeah. But yeah, like, pe- people are still playing it, so. It's going to be one of those games that something like seriously better has to come out to like take people's attention away from it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll have to be something that is a complete sensation. You know? And I just, I don't see that anytime soon. Yeah. We never know. You know, as, as a, as I think Jeff Grubb once said, like the next biggest game is just going to be some random thing on Steam that blows up. Yeah, like, like that. That's that's viral games now. Like companies spending like millions of dollars to make these big AAA games, and it's like well, that's great, you know. And they probably do just fine. Like say Spider Man Two, we know how much that game cost, and I don't know if it'll recoup those costs. You know, maybe over a long period of time, but who knows how long or short or how much they want it to recoup. But then look at a game like, you know. Uh, what, what was that game on Steam a while ago that people were really, really liking? I forget what it was called. Hmm. It was like it was like four people on a planet, and they couldn't like talk to each other, and they were trying to like scrounge up um, resources, keep the profit initiative up. You know, I forget what that game's called. I I know what you're thinking. I can't remember right now. Yeah, I'm but just yeah, thinking of like, but people were really digging that game. And um, and I guarantee you that game has recouped its costs, no problem. Well, I mean, you, <laughs> you, know you also I mean? had um, you also had stuff like uh, like, Pal uh, World. Pa- oh yeah, Pal World. Uh, Pal World I mean, blew go- the fuck up, but it feels like that cooled off real quick. Yeah, because the uh, the controversy went away and everyone lost interest. Yeah, oh, Lethal Company is the game I'm thinking. Lethal of. Company, that's right. Yeah, that game does look fun. Not gonna lie. I mean, even earlier though, like think of like indie games like. Fall Guys and Among Us. They were huge for a while. Yeah. Trombone Champ. That's a fun game. But yeah, or even something like Baldur's Gate 3, which is... Baldur's Gate look, 3. You could almost game. argue that's an indie game. I mean, it technically is. The studio's independent. Yeah. Um, so Baldur's Gate 3 put the fucking industry on notice. <sighs> I don't know if it really did. I think people are kind of overrating that. Uh, it, I don't know. It do, it did a lot better than people expected. Yeah, but it's like, is that game going to cause other studios to, like, I don't I don't expect other studios to match Baldur's Gate three in terms of like content. You know, no, I I, can't, I, don't... I, can't, I feel like 
people can't expect that. And I thought we were bitching about games having too much content already. And now it's like this game does it like, and it's just like, Oh, this game's going to cause other games to be good. It's like, well, I think games are just going to be good regardless. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's so much. We're bitching about the content. It's more how they're using said content. I think Baldur's Gate three's biggest strength is it is such a wealth constructed game. Like there is so much content and all of it is like fun. Well, yeah, but I feel like all games are trying to be that. Yeah, because so, I, I, I think the first time I heard that comparison was Dragon Age Dreadfall, right? Like, because who knows what's going on with Bioware right now? Like, it feels like they're kind of in a weird limbo situation as well. And people were comparing um, Baldur's Gate to that. Whereas people like, oh, can Dragon Age be that? And it's like, it probably won't be. But I imagine if Dragon Age is good on its own merits, it'll be good. Hmm. you know but i mean who knows when we'll see that game again because yeah. i guess it was supposed to come out this year but i think it got pushed back next year i honestly don't know no idea and i imagine once that's done then they're gonna they're all in on the next mass effect but it'll probably be a long time till we get that and i'm fine with waiting you know i, I, I don't need a new mass effect right now no i mean i'm fine with the uh the le- legendary collection I still got to play Witcher 3, man. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the list. I, I genuinely want to get to that game this year and finally sit down and play it properly. I think in terms you know? of what Western RPGs, I have to play Fable 2 first. I've already promised that one. Well, I, I was playing a little bit of Fable 1 for uh, for another podcast. It's a very good game, but um, I don't know when we're going to get to that episode. So I've put it on the back burner for now. But Fable 1, giving it a proper chance again, I would say I'm liking it more. You know what I mean? Like, it's now that I kind of know what I'm getting into with Fable 1, I can appreciate it more for what it is. And plus, on the Series X, it runs so much better. On 1, for some reason, it ran like dog shit. I don't know why. But Series X, it runs perfectly fine. So I think that helps. It's still very clunky, though. Well, yeah, that Fable 2 is, is the best. That game is incredibly clunky. Cool. 2, I, the little bit I played of 2 was so much better. You know, it was, it was, much, it was a much smoother experience. Mm. So, you know, I, I would like to get to the, that trilogy as well. But, you know, it's, it's too many games to play, man. It's ridiculous. Especially when they're like RPGs and people are like, these games are great. And then you look at their how long to beats, or at least that's what I do whenever I'm interested in the game. I immediately check just to see what I'm getting into. And then seeing a game like Witcher Three's time and just be like, ah, but I know it's good. I know it's good. Yeah. Because I played a bit of it on Switch. In fact, I still have my Switch copy over yonder. Right. I think like right there you can see Girl's head. Um, and it's fine, but I remember I was like, ah, this on Switch though, you know, it was running fine. You know, like if it's all you have, go ahead. But when I got the Xbox copy, I was like, Oh yeah, this is much better. And started playing it, but then that's when I got COVID. And playing that game when you have COVID is, I wouldn't recommend it. So I put it down. And then by the time I was well again, I completely forgot what I was doing. And I didn't want to restart it. Yeah. So that's kind of where I am with Witcher 3. But hopefully this year, it, this year it might be like the big RPG I play. Mm. But we'll see. I mean, I am, I mean, to be fair, Infinite Wealth is a big one as well. Yeah. So. Persona 3 Reload and. So, so I don't know if I'm gonna get to Persona 3 this year. I'd like to, but I don't know if I am. Yeah. No, I get it. I need yeah. to beat a Persona game at, at some point. It'll but the one I will beat is four, because I genuinely like four. Can't I can't say I disagree. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so we got about an hour and a half out of this. Just Nothing like shooting the shit. Shooting some bullshit uh, last minute. Eh, um we make it work yeah but um is, is this content i don't know if it's content maybe i mean maybe people enjoy the parasocial aspect of podcasts where you listen to people talk and then you like commentate at it while you're listening to it i think this is a record for our first episode where we didn't mention the 3do like once <laughs> yeah well to be fair i haven't played the game that's next i haven't even touched it yet so i mean there's not much there <laughs> <laughs> oh oh well that oh. oh that game no i've played that one i'm talking to like the oh, talking shockwave. About shockwave yeah i haven't touched shockwave yet 
Okay. But, I was going to say, I'm like, that no, is not no, much the, to say no, about our next game. No, Shanghai Triple Threat, I have, I have played. I, I played more of it than I expected. I, I bopped to the music. That's that's usually what I did. I'll, I'll, I'll refrain any words. Yeah. We, I'm we not saying keep, it's good. We, I'm not saying it's good. But, I'm saying uh, it's a game. That's what yeah. I'll say. It's one of the games of all time. Yes. But yeah, so next week we'll do our co- our big collab. And uh, following that, we'll do Shockwave. But once again, guys, thanks for joining us on the 3DO Experience. Uh, you can find the 3DO Experience on all the major podcasting platforms. Uh, the YouTube version of this episode will be out shortly after its release. And you can uh, find all of our links at linktree slash the Barber Games. And if you'd like, you can join the GNC Podcast Network Discord server. Talk all things GNC, 3DO, Geek Addicts, gaming, anime, all sorts of stuff. And with that, guys, we will see you all later. Bye-bye. If you're not playing on a 3DO system... What are you playing with?